guys, this is just incredible. This is what we talked about last week, loaves and fishes sitting up there. That's amazing to me. West Silliger is an unconventional Episcopalian minister who loves, of all things, motorcycles. Motorcycles. And he tells about being in a motorcycle shop one day, and the salesman comes up to him, and he's, he's admiring a Honda 750, really wishing he could buy it. And the salesman begins to, to pitch that, his little sales pitch, and, and talk about all of the wonderful things about this little Honda 750. Talks about speed and, and acceleration and excitement and attention getting growl of the pipes and, and the racing and the risks involved. And then, then he talks to him about how, how he's going to get the good looking girls paying attention to him with this kind of a bike. But then he discovered that Wes was a minister. And I can promise you this really happens. Things like this happen all the time the minute people find out that you are a pastor. Immediately, the salesperson changed his language around, and instead of talking about all the excitement and the, the roar and the attention getting, he says very quietly and very practically, he talks about the mileage and how it even is a practical vehicle for someone such as a minister. Now, Wes observed that lawnmower salesmen are never surprised to find pastors in their midst. But motorcycle salesmen always are surprised to find a pastor in their midst. And he asked himself why. And he goes on to say that this may tell us a little bit about pastors and, more importantly, about the church. Lawn mowers are slow and sane and practical and middle class. Motorcycles are fast and daring and dangerous and wild and thrilling. So then Wes asks this question. He says, is being a Christian more like mowing a lawn or like riding a motorcycle? Is the Christian life safe and sound or dangerous and exciting? He concludes, the common image of the church is pure lawnmower slow, deliberate, plodding. Our task is is to take the church out on the open road and see what the old baby can do. So is our church a lawnmower church or a motorcycle church? Maybe it's time that we start taking a few more risks for God. Now before diving into our, our text today, I want to set the stage a little bit. We need to look back into last week's reading to kind of understand what's happening here. It's been a long and busy day for Jesus and for the disciples. As Eric preached last week, just before the events in tonight's, in today's readings rather, the disciples witnessed a miracle. Do you remember, remember what we talked about last week? What was our miracle? Loaves and fishes, loaves and fishes. He feeds 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, with five barley loaves and two small fish. So no doubt, this was a day of highs. The disciples are on a real high. They've just witnessed an incredible miracle. So this is the end of the day in today's scripture, and let's listen in. Verses 22 and 23. Immediately after this, Jesus made his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. Afterwards, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. Night fell, and he was there alone. Now, in John's version of the fabulous feeding, we read that, that once the people saw this miracle, their intent was to take Jesus and make him king by force. And so Jesus... Uh, he tells his disciples, you know, get, get in the boat, go to the other side of the lake. He's probably doing it for their own safety. And then he stays behind and lets, gets the people to go on home. And then he goes up into the hills to pray, right? Now, that's a, this is a side note here, but that's an important part to remember. No matter how busy Jesus was, no matter what was going on, he always took time to spend time in prayer talking with his father. So there's just a little side note in this scripture. Now, what about those disciples? Well, it tells us that meanwhile the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. Now, the peaceful calm of the Galilean Sea can change very, very rapidly into a violent storm. 
This, this sea actually sits below sea level, and the winds that come out of the Golan Heights to the east can be very, very powerful, and they can stir the water very quickly. Now, trapped in the basin, as the disciples were, can be deadly to a fisherman. There was a storm as recently as March of 1998 that came crashing through and did a tremendous amount of damage into downtown Tiberias. Well, on that night so long ago, just such a storm arose and was tossing the disciples about. Now, the lake the disciples were trying to cross is actually about seven miles wide. Now, they had left before dark, and according to John's version, at this point in the story, the disciples had only managed to row out about three and a half miles. Now, how many of you have been stuck in bumper to bumper traffic on the Basin Bridge? Anybody? Or even the I-10 bridge or the 210 bridge? You know, sometimes you get in there and, and you're stuck. You, you, you think, oh my goodness, you can sit there for hours before things clear, right? Especially on the Basin Bridge, because getting the emergency personnel through there is sometimes difficult. Hours, no food, no water, and come on, let's do the most important thing, no toilet facilities in sight, right? That is really nerve-wracking. Well, by the time the situation clears, we find that we are, oh, well, a little more than just frustrated, exhausted, and perhaps even scared. And I would expect that that's kind of how the disciples felt at this time. They were alone in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was nowhere to be found. But about 3 o'clock in the morning, here comes Jesus walking on water. And when the disciples see him, what do they do? They, they scream. They're terrified. Why? What do they think he is? They think he's a ghost, right? They think he's a ghost. Now, most translations say that Jesus showed up during the fourth watch of the night. Now, this was really anywhere between the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. That means the disciples have been at sea anywhere between 9 and 12 hours at this point. You can imagine the scene. The wind is blowing, it's dark, and the disciples are struggling to get their boat to go. And they look and they see this figure casually walking out across the water. How in the world would you react? I'd be screaming in terror too, I believe. Now, fear is healthy a lot of times, though. If you think about it, fear is what keeps us from hurting ourselves when we do stupid things, right? It's one of those things that that's, can be very positive. It's what keeps people, most people, off of cliffs or maybe away from the edges of buildings. Well, so fear among the disciples in this situation really was okay. It really was okay. But Jesus spoke to them anyway, and he said, It's all right. It's all right. I'm here. It's okay. Don't be afraid. Have you ever noticed the number of times Jesus has to tell the disciples not to be afraid? You know, they're either afraid or asleep a whole lot of the time. Jesus seems to repeat that a lot. But what about us? What about us? Are we sometimes too gripped with fear to answer when God calls us? Do we find ourselves huddling in the bottom of our boat instead of stepping overboard? Are we so afraid of jumping on that motorcycle that we are content to ride around in circles on our little lawnmowers? Now, Peter wasn't. Peter wasn't. Listen to what this says, verses 28 and 29. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it really is you, tell me to come to you by walking on water. All right, come, Jesus says. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on water toward Jesus. That's my favorite part of the story. Peter walked on water toward Jesus. Isn't that just, oh, wow, Peter. Peter does something that he knows is impossible. He's been around water all of his life, and frankly, in this area, he's probably never seen a lake frozen over with people even walking over it, let alone one that's not frozen over. But he wants to be as close to Jesus as he can possibly be. So he asks for the impossible. Now, most people, when they read this scripture, skip right over that part. They tend to focus more on Peter's failure once he gets over the boat and falls into the water. They, we shouldn't remember that Peter sank. We should remember that Peter tried. 
Peter tried. Peter did something that none of the 11 other disciples did. He got out of the boat. Now, Peter took the risk of doing something that he had never done before, something that even you and I know to be impossible for us. But Peter does this simply because he wants to get to Jesus. He takes a risk just to get closer to Jesus. It's motorcycle faith. Now, are you like Peter? Or are you like the other 11 disciples? Are you afraid to take risks in your life because you're afraid you might fail? Uh, but have you found that, that the good things in life really come when we are willing to go out on a limb and take a risk? See, there's no telling what God can do in and through us if we just overcome our fears and get out of the boat. Now, throughout history, the only times the Christian church has really seen tremendous growth at any given time is when people actively reached out to others by obeying the Great Commission. Anybody know the Great Commission? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, every time that the Christian church has gotten away from the relative safety of our comfort zones and has actually taken risks, the church has flourished. Now, maybe you have a wonderful testimony that you could share with others. There's testimony about what God has done in your life, but maybe you're too afraid to share your testimony with others. Do you realize that if you keep it to yourself, people are other people? are missing out on the blessings that you have to share. We all grow when we share our faith with others and tell others what God has done in our lives. A fisherman spent half a day picking out just the right campsite. He finally found what he knew was going to be the perfect place. And he spends the rest of the day setting up camp, tents and all the camping gear all set up end of the day, he, he goes to bed looking forward to the catch the next day. So he gets up early and he finds a nice rock to sit on on the, on the stream and casts his line into water. And about two hours go by and he hasn't even had so much as a nibble. But he did notice that upstream a little ways, the fish were really jumping. Now, if you were this fisherman, what would you do? You would move. Okay, now let me ask you. Let me ask you this, would you demand then that the fish come to you? Or would you go to where the fish, I heard move, we would move. I'd pack up everything and go to where the fish were jumping. You see, Jesus never once said the lost need to come to church. He often said the church needs to go to the lost. We make a difference when in the kingdom, when we hop on our motorcycle ride along through life, boldly proclaiming the gospel, instead of simply being content to hang out around the churchyard on our mowers, waiting for folks to come to us. Now notice, Peter takes a real risk getting out of the boat, but it wasn't a rash decision. It was a calculated risk. And God doesn't want us to take unnecessary risks, but instead to, step, to take steps of faith that are based on wisdom and understanding. Now, Peter sought the will of Christ before he ever stopped out of the boat. Do you remember what he said? He said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you by walking on water. When you take a risk that you have prayed about and that you know is God's will for you in your life, then you will also know that God's will will not leave you alone. He's going to track you down until you step out of the boat, right? He does. Well, the problems start when we forget that God is with us and we begin to focus on the things of this world. That's what happened to Peter, right? When he looked around at the high waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. And he said, Lord, help me. It's like that moment, you know Wile E. Coyote? You remember Wile E. Coyote? It's that moment when he runs off several feet off the cliff and then he remembers that little thing called gravity. He's doing fine until he remembers that little thing called gravity. But with Jesus on our side, we will succeed in everything he calls us to do. And when we take our eyes off of Jesus, like Peter did, and I promise you there will come a time when you will take your eyes off of Jesus, 
and we cry out, Lord, help me, he'll do what he did with Peter. Immediately, he reached down and picked him up. So then he tells him, you don't have very much faith. Why'd you doubt me? Do you realize how safe and secure we have made the Christian faith? There was a time when the church was challenging its young people to go out as missionaries all over the world into lands that were hostile and foreboding. And young people by the thousands traded in their lawnmowers for motorcycles. During the Civil Rights Movement, there were Christians who risked their lives to promote the notion that all people are created equal. Some were beaten, some were ostracized, some even died. But people from all walks of life hopped on motorcycles to make a difference in the world. How about our church? What great risks are we taking for God? You know, I heard we weren't going to be able to do this. I heard that from people. We did it. That's motorcycle faith up there. God needs people who are, who are willing to leave the relative safety of the boat People who are willing to trade in their lawn mowers for motorcycles. How about you? I have a suggestion. Strap on your motorcycle helmet and get out of the boat. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.